field theories, um, quantum field theories without gravity included are well understood. They beautifully describe interactions of uh, all elementary particles we know, you know, we have these beautiful Feynman diagrams and, and all looks good. And we know what constitutes a consistent quantum field theory if you do not include gravity. So as long as there's no gravity in the game, we know how everything works. <clears throat> now, if you say we want to have gravity, as we do know, we want to, because in our universe, we do have gravity. Uh, what we usually say is that you take a quantum theory and you couple it to gravity. And what that, this, uh, what that statement ends up being is something rather uh, straightforward in the sense that you take an action and uh, basically you, you include the Einstein-Hilbert term and you promote the metric, which may have been flat to an arbitrary metric, and you integrate over the space of metrics and whatever you had, the gauge fields or the fermions or matter field or whatnot. And that's what we call coupling the uh, quantum field theory to the metric. And, you know, we think that this should be more or less good. Uh, if, if the original theory was good, if you promote the metric to a dynamical metric and add the Einstein-Hilbert term, you can get started and, and hope for the best. This approach does not work. The infinities appearing in the Feynman diagrams are incurable, and so a conventional approach to quantizing gravity does not work, as Feynman already discovered in the 1960s. So we already know this is a headache for quantum gravity. Quantum gravity does not follow this rule. Now, if you take this, up, if you take this view, and the most uh, natural conclusion from this would have been, oh, sorry, gravity cannot be coupled to quantum fields consistently and should always be viewed only as a background. Of course, this cannot be consistent because in our universe, we have a dynamical gravity and we have a quantum theory. So we there better be a resolution. So this approach doesn't work is not an acceptable answer from the viewpoint of our universe. Well, we often say string theory solves this issue. We say that the point particles are replaced by extended strings and this leads to consistent quantum theories of gravity. And in this context, what it means is that you replace quantum field theory with quantum string field theory. And so we think that should be okay, and we go with that. And so that seems like a, a, like a resolution. We, we basically say string field theory resolves the inconsistency of quantum field theories. And that's the, that's the new ingredient, is the extended nature of the particles. And we, we have the usual perturbative diagrams, which we are familiar with, where we replace the Feynman diagrams with the usual tubes of strings, and we know how to compute these amplitudes. Uh, they have beautiful geometry, they have beautiful structure. I don't need to tell the group here how beautiful string field theory is and how perturbative diagrams arise uh, in a beautiful way from such a, such a theory. <clears throat> but can we get every consistent quantum field theory in four dimension coupled to gravity from string theory? That's a question we want to ask. If you start with a consistent one, can you just say, okay, uh, usual particle theory didn't work, but can you make that work within string theory? Can, can a low energy limit of string theory give, give rise to that quantum field theory? String theory comes with a six extra dimension, as we know, and these should be viewed as compact, tiny spaces. If we want to get a four dimensional dynamical gravity, it better be compact. Uh, and we take the viewpoint that they are so small that we don't have a problem with observation. And in, in fact, many solutions to string equation, uh, which is conformal invariance of the worksheet already are known. And we have a huge number of possibilities for what the internal space could be. Some of them are geometric, like the picture I'm drawing here, but many of them can also be non-geometric conformal field theories that we can deal with. So we have by now quite a bit of experience about the space, the huge space of possibilities within string theory. And so this is a, ca a caricature of what we mean, of course, that at every point in space time, we have some particular conformal theory. Of course, if we wanna have a conformal theory that does not depend on space, uh, as we want to have a vacuum, which looks more or less like Minkowski, we just choose the same fixed space at the given point in Minkowski space. Of course, we get objects depending on uh, what kind of geometries we take. 
here I'm describing a torus geometry and we have some, some winding strings or brains or whatnot, but more, more generally, you could have a complicated, you know, calabia or some exotic geometry, and you can have a different kinds of states from the viewpoint of three-dimensional space, which corresponds to brains or particles or strings, uh, which have various uh, wrapping conditions or excitations or oscillations in this extra dimension. And for our perspective, they all look like particles, but uh, they will have different properties depending on which kind of geometry uh, the wrapping they are doing or which kind of excitations they are describing. So in this, get, in this way, we get a plethora of possible quantum systems with the quantum, with various kinds of particles and interactions. So it's a huge number of possibilities. So for example, one of these compactifications might lead to a gate symmetry in four dimension, let's say, with SU4 gate symmetry with two generation of light, light uh, representation, let's say in fundamental. Another one might give you a different gauge group with this gate symmetry observed in four dimension with SU3 times SU4, let's say, with other matter representations. And the question is, can you get arbitrary consistent quantum field theory by choosing a suitable intermediate compact theory or conformal field theory in the middle to give you whatever you want? Can this be possible? The thing that we are learning from string theory is that the answer we indeed is no, that we cannot get arbitrary quantum field theories. Not only that, it's far from it. Indeed, we seem to obtain only a finite number of quantum field theories from string theory. By this, I mean a finite number of quantum field theories in the low energy limit of a quantum gravitational theory. For example, if you take a maximal supersymmetric theories in four dimensions, that is n equals to four supersymmetry, which has matter in it. Of course, we can have more supersymmetry if you're not interested in matter. The, if you want to have matter, let's take n equals to four. The rank of the gauge group we get from string theory is always less than 23. So for example, the gauge group SUM, where M is bigger than 23, all of which are consistent quantum field theories do not arise in string theory coupled to gravity. Let me clarify what I'm trying to say here. There is nothing wrong with n equals to four supersymmetric angles for arbitrary SUM. Problem appears if you want to couple it to gravity. In fact, SUM for arbitrary M is perfectly fine and holographically dual to quantum gravity. So again, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with holography. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with SUM gauge theory with large M. What I am saying is that if you want to couple that gauge theory n equals to four SUM to n equals to four supergravity in four dimensions, you cannot do, at least you cannot get it from string theory if the rank is too, bigger than 20, is M is bigger than 23. <clears throat> so is there a simple way to explain this 23? There is, a, there is a way to explain it using some of the conditions that I will mention. These have to do with the, some of the properties that we describe in string theory called the distance conjecture, and, and these, or which is related to dualities in string theory. So there are features that string theory implies this, but to get to those features uh, it takes a while. So in other words, it's not a straightforward statement from detective field theory. Effective field theory might have no problem with this. It sounds like it's perfectly fine. So, um, I mean, what about stack of d brains? You can have more d brains than one is three, no? You can have arbitrary number of stack of d brains if you have more than four non-compact directions. Because if you have, let's say, stack of d three brains, where mm -hmm. the transfer space is compact, you violate Gauss's law. Oh, I see. You can do oriented fold, and you can put thirty-two of those d brains. And you cancel, but no more. <laughs> That's related okay. to the problem I'm mentioning. In other words, the Gauss's law kills you. So there's no problem with having an, a defect with arbitrary rank gauge group coupled to a higher dimensional gravity. That's not a problem. That's related to holography. It's related to SUN with arbitrary n equals to four Yang Mills, but that's not coupled to gravity in that dimension. Is that clear? Okay, thank you. Okay. So so it seems that the quantum field theories that we get from string theory, at least from the n equals to four case, form a measure zero. That is, if you, if you take a random m, it spans from one to infinity, but only a finite number of them appear. So the ratio of the allowed possibilities to all possibilities is zero, because there are infinitely many possibilities 
for consistent theory, but the only ones that you get in string theory are rare. So, a so therefore, a generic consistent quantum field theory cannot be consistently coupled to gravity. That conclusion that Feynman could have drawn is correct. For a consistent theory to be couplable to gravity, there's much more restrictive conditions that has to be satisfied. And the question is what conditions? Now, this raises two conditions. Does the fact that most quantum field theories do not arise in string theory, a deficiency of string theory, or a general conclusion about consistency requirements for coupling to quantum gravity? One could say, you know, sorry about it. String theory is useless. It doesn't give you most of these guys, so we'll study something else. That might have been a conclusion. Of course, this crowd who's studying string field theory, I don't need to convince you that this is not the correct answer, but we have evidence suggesting that there are other reasons that some of these theories are inconsistent beyond string theory. So in other words, we are, we are getting a more out of string theory view of what is wrong with some of these theories. So, uh, so there, therefore these subtle consistency reasons that we're getting for quantum gravity could preclude many of these theories that we think are perfectly okay. But we're getting this hint from string theory that there should be something wrong. Now you can ask what criteria distinguish a good quantum field theory, what we could call part of the string landscape from bad quantum field theories. Again, by good and bad, again, I mean coupleable to gravity. By themselves, they could be both good. So in other words, I view quantum field theories which by themselves are good, but cannot be coupled to gravity as belonging to what we call the swampland. Instead of belonging to the string landscape, we call them they belong to the swampland, namely, the quantum field theory is that if you did not know about quantum gravity per se, you would have said they are perfectly fine, like n equals to four Yang mills for SG100. There's perfectly fine quantum field theory, but that's a bad quantum field theory if you want to couple it to gravity. It cannot be coupled to quantum gravity in 4D. So the Swampland program is to try to understand these criteria and, and uh, have a, uh, first of all, basically summarize the lessons we have learned into, from string theory examples into criteria and secondly explain them without using string theory per se. In other words, go beyond string theory to try to explain this as some universality condition for consistency of quantum gravity to tell us what is consistent quantum gravity mean. So again, this is a caricature of what I've been saying. So if you look at the space of possibilities here, the allowed possibilities are much vaster than the ones that are possible with these string constructions. So for example, in the context of, uh, of the allowed space of possibilities, if you space of all possible quantum field theories, I draw them by this green space, there are only, we believe there are only five number of them. It could be a huge number, finite but huge, number of them which can be described from string theory or derived from string theory, which we call the string landscape. And hopefully one of these, one of these are uh, the one we live in. The standard model will be part of that. Notice that um, this also tells you that some aspects of naturalness program could have a natural solution in this context of the swampland program, because there are a lot of fine tunings in the standard model, the hierarchy problem, the cosmological constant problem, uh, the CP problem. All, all of these issues sound like amazing fine tunings in the standard model, which have no natural explanation. However, the prior of that naturalness is that the space of possibilities is much bigger. So if you have a prior of being able to consist coupled to quantum gravity, it is perfectly conceivable that the allowed possibilities narrow you down. And within that narrow subset, we are not fine tuning. So then, so in other words, the standard model, which appears fine tuned in the much bigger space, in a much smaller space, which includes the prior to be consistently coupleable to gravity might not be unnatural anymore. So let me, um, so let me, so this is basically the setting up of the, what, what this program is. And now to basically say, what are some of these requirements that we are learning for the, for the theory to be, uh, to be good. In other words, some of the criteria not to be in the sombra. First, the first simplest property is that there are no global symmetries. If you have a quantum field theory, which have global symmetries, that theory cannot be coupled to gravity. Secondly, uniqueness of quantum gravity. 
Now, by, by uniqueness of quantum gravity, I mean that uh, you can go from any quantum gravitational system to any other with finite action. So suppose you're in four dimensions and you have one four dimensional quantum gravity and somebody says, well, I have found another quantum gravity with 4D, which is consistent. The coordinates and conjecture says that there's a finite path to go from one to the other. Namely, within that space, you can, within you, any of those two quantum gravities, with finite action, you should be able to create a bubble of the other universe with the other quantum gravity. There is no obstruction with, in physics to go from one to the other. In that sense, quantum gravity, all of them are fluctuations of one to the other. So therefore it's unique. This is not the duality statement, just to make sure we understand. This is much stronger than the duality statement. The third statement is that the only symmetries are gauge symmetries. And for those, all the charges appear in the spectrum. If you have a gauge symmetry, the, there's a complete spectrum of allowed charges. If you have a field space, like scalar fields, which let's say have no potential, uh, the, the effective range for them, for the field space is finite if you want to have not, no breakdown your effective field theory. In other words, if you have effective field theory, which is valid, your effective field theory will become invalid if you go to infinite range. That's the statement. That is, if you have, a, let me say it more clearly. If you have a finite set of fields in your theory, which is valid below a certain scale, then and if you have a scalar field in that theory, if you take that scalar field to large values, that effective field theory is going to break down by having some other modes coming into the game that we had ignored. This turns out to be related to the duality conjecture. The fifth one is that the theory admits higher dimensional objects. This light, I didn't mean light here, just higher dimensional objects, like in string theory. We have membranes or strings or so on. You cannot have a theory of quantum gravity which did not have any extended objects. Gravity owes always the weakest force. If you have a gravity force and some other gauge force, gravity is weaker, is the weakest of them all. And then there are restrictions on critical points of uh, potentials with positive value. And this has some cosmological implications. This is called the Dissiter conjectures. So I'm going to review some aspects of all of these. Any questions? Okay. I have a question there, sorry. Yes. Uh, what do you mean by these uh, uh, all gauge charges up here? What do you mean by so gauge suppose charges? Suppose you have a U1 here? gauge theory. Mm -hmm. Well, then charge one, charge two, charge three may or may not be part of your spectrum. In other words, you may not have any particles with any charges, for example. Or you might have charges only even ones, or every multiple of three might appear. So you're this saying says, that all gauge that, charges appear. This says that that cannot be consistently coupled to gravity. All of them should appear. Okay. I, sorry, I have a question about um, the higher dimensional objects. Just to, to understand, in a strongly coupled uh, gravity, how can I see that an object is uh, really extended? I mean, uh, how I, it's clear if I start from Minkowski or from a weak uh, coupled gravity, but if I am in a strong coupled uh, re regime, how can I define an extended object? What is I, I will try to explain. I will try to explain this point five so that you will, you will see what I mean by how we can describe it. So and the, uh, the idea ba basically ends up to start not just by the Minkowski but take the Minkowski with a large periodic box. You identify, you, you identify two sides. In that context is where you begin to probe these questions. But I, I will come to it. But some basic facts about black holes that we all know, uh, just reminding you that for a fixed charge Q and a mass M, there are uh, solutions to Einstein's equation with no naked singularities if M is bigger than Q. M equals to Q can also occur. This is called the extremal black hole. I'm using the, the units of uh, M in Planck units and some Q in some suitable units. So there's this M equals to Q can also occur. And this is what we call extremal black holes, horizon northern black holes. Black holes have thermodynamic properties. Uh, in fact, Wittgenstein and Hawking point this out and they carry entropy. 
namely the entropy of a black hole is the one quarter of the area of the event horizon. Okay, so these are some obvious facts, but there's one further fact that, uh, oops, I forgot to say, that we believe black holes have thermodynamic properties and in particular they evaporate according to Hawking, um, Hawking uh, evaporation. The only counter examples to evaporation is if you have supersymmetric extremal black holes. Every other examples that we know always decay. So I'm gonna assume that all the black holes decay with the exception of the supersymmetric ones. Every other black hole decays. Okay, so let me then start with no global symmetries. Suppose you have a global charge Q, throw a conserved global charge into a black hole. If you throw a global charge into a black hole, there is no effect outside because it's a global charge. There's no electric field coming out. So you cannot measure from the outside of the black hole any aspect having to do with which charge is inside. Therefore, the evaporation of the black hole proceeds the same way with or without that charge. So therefore, the effect of the charge evaporation of the black hole, since it does not know whether it has charge inside or not, will give you a neutral set of charges, equal pluses and minus of these global charges. And therefore, the process of throwing a charge inside the black hole and waiting the black hole to evaporate leads to violation of that global charge. So that seems to say that, okay, if you had a global charge, it would be not conserved. Therefore, uh, and the black hole would be method to do it. This argument does not preclude gate charges appearing. The reason is if you did the same thing and you throw a gate charge in, then there are electrical fields outside created and the evaporation of the black hole will prefer more of the same sign charge as you threw in. And therefore, indeed, the charge conservation is follows from Gauss's law. So you cannot violate the charge conservation in that case. So there's no problem with gate symmetry but there's a problem with global symmetry. So global symmetries are not allowed, but gate symmetries are perfectly fine. Now I will talk about uniqueness of quantum gravity. This is a generalization of no global symmetry conjecture. Now any consistent quantum gravity can be deformed to any other through a finite action physical process. So this is, this is the basic uh, part of the conjecture. Suppose so, so let me try to explain what do I mean by this. So suppose you compactify a string theory, let's say, on a manifold M. And suppose somebody else compactifies the string theory on a different manifold M. And suppose um, we study all the possible ways you can go from M to N with finite action. So this gives you a class. Basically, you can define equivalence class of manifolds, which you can go from one to the other with finite action. This defines, in fact, a group because you can add them together. If you have two manifolds, you can put them together and you get another, you get a natural group structure. And this is called the cobordism uh, group. So cobordism conjecture says that the cobordism group is trivial, that from any one, you can go to any other one. Now, why is that? Well, if you couldn't do that, you can use if you say that there is one particular one, you cannot go to any other one, one particular one, that itself defines a global charge because that's the characteristic class of that manifold that gives you a conserved quantity, which is global, and that's a problem. So therefore, the absence of global charge can have this extension, which is uh, basically the uniqueness of quantum gravity. By this charge, I mean the higher form charge. The higher form charge means the uncompactified space can be itself carry a charge. And that is the charge of which manifold you have picked. And that cannot be according to no global symmetries or more generally according to this cobordism conjecture. Now, this is actually quite interesting because it basically says that every theory of quantum gravity should admit a boundary because, from the, because uh, any manifold can go to even no manifold, so to speak. And so if you project it down to the space, what you are saying is that every manifold can end can, can any compactivation of string theory could have a situation where it disappears at the end. In other words, from, from our viewpoint, our universe should admit a boundary as well. In other words, we are saying that even our gravity in three plus one dimensions, you should be able to have a situation where you have a three dimensional space ending with nothing on the other side. That should be allowed in a consistent theory of quantum gravity. 
So by finite charge, what do you mean exactly? Uh, finite, a finite, a finite, a finite action. I'm sorry, finite that action. Actually means there's a, if you view this as a time, there should be a finite action process. So this is action in the target space, like string field theory action or yes. something? Yes, yes. Okay. There's extra dimensional space I'm ignoring. So finite action per unit volume, I'm basically meaning here. Okay, the third criteria is that all gauge charges appear in the spectrum. So suppose you have a U1 gauge symmetry and all integer charges are in principle allowed to exist. Do they have to appear? Without gravity, a priori, there's no problem. For example, you can imagine having a U1 Maxwell theory with no charges at all, no charge states at all. There's no problem from the viewpoint of quantum field theory, pure, Yang, pure uh, Maxwell theory. However, with gravity, the story changes and you must get charged states. The reason is easy to explain because charged black holes are allowed. And according to Hawking, there's entropy. Namely, the, since the, you have a mass and a charge, uh, for if mass is bigger than or equal to charge, we know such black holes exist. According to Beckenstein and Hawking, there's an event horizon who, which carries the entropy of these states. That means the number of such states in your Hilbert space grows exponentially with the area of the horizon. That means there are states, n states, with charge mass, charge and mass m and q. And therefore, you cannot say that we don't have a state of charge q. Since, since the charge, since the black holes appear for arbitrary charge, then we are we are we are done. Now you could say, well, how do we know that appears for all charge? Because charge one, this is a Planckian, maybe Planckian black hole, clearly for large enough mass and charge, they appear. And if you take one big charge Q plus one, another big charge minus Q, then you conclude by charge conservation that there is a state of charge one. So even charge one state can appear, should appear. And that's a completeness. Now, this is for the U1 gauge group and you can, have, you can extend this to our other gauge groups. The arguments of the black hole will have more difficult time to try to explain it using arbitrary discrete gauge symmetries and arbitrary representations of it, but such arguments some ex extensions of these arguments also can be made for those cases. But, but let's suppose, for example, we have charge two. What guarantees you that there, there's no just, just uh, instead of one charge two, just two charges one? Well, first of all, take the Q to be large and an odd number. Okay. Well, that's it. So that's it. There's a, there's, a, there's a state with that entropy according to Bekenstein and Hawking. That's it. Criteria four is that the range of fields are finite. This is related to what we call the duality conjecture or distance conjecture. Uh, consider a scalar field phi. Without gravity, we usually have no restriction on its range. For example, phi could be a real variable, could go from minus infinity to plus infinity. However, with gravity, it seems that the range of this field for a given effective theory, if you fix an effective cutoff of your field theory, cannot be any bigger than Planck scale. That's in four dimensions, if you want to talk about 4D, the range in the field space is less than order one in Planck units. Now, again, this does not mean that you cannot make the range of phi bigger and bigger, but what it implies is that your effective theory breaks down, which means that you get a tower of like states. In other words, if, if this is the space of the phi space, I'm drawing a multi-dimensional scalar field space with no potential, with some action like grad phi squared with some metric. If you go, this, this kinetic term defines a natural metric on this space. If you go to the large distance in the, in the field space, your description breaks down. That's what, that's what we know in string theory. That is every time you take any scalar field to infinity, you always have a new description emerging. You get a tower of light states appearing. And so the mass of this tower goes exponentially with distance. So you get an exponentially large, exponentially uh, uh, decaying mass with some exponents, each to the minus alpha phi, where alpha is order one in Planck units. So this is, in other words, you, any time you put a cutoff, you cannot, you can, you can, if you include more and more of these, you can push the range of validity farther, but it doesn't matter uh, how many fields you include, as long as there are a finite number of fields you include, at some point, that description breaks down because you get new tower coming down. 
in the exponential form. So effective field theory always breaks down at large distance. And that is precisely what, what triggers duality, namely the light degrees of freedom that become, uh, become available for large distances are the degrees of freedom that describe uh, the, um, the dual description. Just let me just give you an example so, so you know what I mean. One simple example of this is string coupling constant. So phi, the dilaton, is an example of this. If you take the string coupling to go to infinity, you get the light states. What is the light states in the string coupling going to zero? It is the tower of string states. Now, you might say you might be used to thinking of string states scale mass one. In string units, the mass is order one, but that's not in Planck units. So what I'm talking about here is the mass in Einstein frame. So in Einstein frame, the strings become lighter and lighter as G string goes to infinity, G string goes to zero. In other words, the Planck mass goes into becomes higher and higher. So in Planck, the, the, the string mass in Planck units goes exponentially down in the limit as G string goes to zero. Now, any effective field theory, like in string field theory, if you keep any finite cutoff, let's say you say I keep 10 to the four of the string states. If you take G string goes to zero so for sufficiently large G string, that description breaks down because the, the effective tower that you have to keep should be more and more. In other words, there'll be more and more of them become light. So therefore that's the statement here that there is no, there is no regime that you can have infinite range. You always have a finite regime for a given effective cutoff description for your field theory. A potential application of the distance conjecture is to cosmological constant. Namely, cosmological constant itself can be viewed as, as exponential of some field. What do I mean by this is that the metric, metric in, in the space time that we live in itself is a field. And you can talk about the distance in the field of the gravity of the metric space and it defines a distance. And the distance goes like exponential of a field. So therefore, uh, saying that there is a, uh, the, the phi is large in our case is consistent because phi is about 300 in our universe if you want to fit the cosmological constant, lambda, which is 10 to the minus 122 in Planck units. So phi is really big in Planck units in our universe. And therefore, you would expect that in our universe, we should be getting a tower of light states where m goes like lambda to the a, or e to the minus the exponential of phi, where a is of order one. So in fact, I, I, I'm not going to describe it in detail, but in our universe, it turns out that we can argue further that this exponent a is one quarter and the light tower that we are talking about are momentum excitations in, a, in an extra dimension, one higher dimension uh, of a scale of micron, which we call the dark dimension. So, so the existence of a small cosmological constant already motivates the existence of a light tower of states. Now, you might, you, might, you might say, do we have further evidence for such towers? If the sign of lambda were negative, if the sign of lambda were negative, then instead of our universe, instead of positive energy, we get negative energy or anti-decider space. For anti-decider space, we have a huge number of examples in string theory the ADS examples. And for all of them, as lambda goes to zero, there is a light tower which scales like some power of lambda. Indeed, the, the most of the examples in string theory, that exponent is one half. So, so therefore, there's a huge amount of evidence for this if you replace the lambda with absolute value of lambda for negative lambda. And so this is simply applying it for positive lambda. So therefore, this is already tantalizing that uh, the fact that in string theory, you cannot have a pure ADS. If you have a pure ADS and you take the ADS scale to be smaller and smaller, uh, the, the curvature of ADS to be smaller and smaller, which means the ADS becoming bigger and bigger, you will always get a tower of light state. The way it happens in ADS is that you have some internal dimension like a sphere or something, which at the same time gets bigger and bigger. In other words, when we talk about, for example, ADS five times S5, ADS5 cannot make arbitrarily low curvature without making decompactifying S5. You don't have the fixed S5. So holography sometimes is misnomer. People say it's ADS CFD. That is not the correct word, version to say. This ADS times an extra ingredient 
times dual to CFT. The extra ingredient is crucial for this to be working. Namely, you cannot just have a pure ADS. Pure ADS does not exist. You cannot make it arbitrarily big. Now I come to the question that was asked about the extended objects. So there must be extended objects in any theory of quantum gravity like M theory. In M theory, we have membranes or in string theory, we have strings. Now I will try to explain why this follows, at least heuristically from the previous criteria. So take your theory, whatever you have, compact find on a circle of radius R. It turns out that that radius R, if you want to normalize the scale, the field properly in one lower dimension, gives rise to a scalar field phi, the dilation mode, which is related to the radius by e to the phi. Now, if you take phi to, inf if you take phi to infinity, indeed you get a tower of light states. What is that tower? The tower of light states are the KK, causal Klein tower, which is just the usual one over things which go like one over R. So that's the usual thing we are familiar with. The, we get the energy of the KK momentum modes, which go like e to the minus phi. That's, a, that's an example of this distance conjecture. However, we can also go the other way. We can take phi to much, much less than zero. In other words, you can take R to zero. This might sound strange because if you, if you did not have, because naively you might think that the duality, so if you did this, and if you did not have any extended objects, you would get the fact that this KK modes become heavier and heavier. So you'll get a truncation of your theory to lower dimension with no extra fields. The distance conjecture says, no, this, there's, something should break down. There should be some light tower. There should be something becoming light. But that's not possible with KK modes, as I just mentioned. The only natural mechanism for this to happen is if we have extended objects which feed the global topology, which can wrap around the global topology and become light as you shrink it down. So the strings and the membranes or some other extended object must be there so it becomes light or tensionless in the limit that these wrapping, it wraps such a space. Without this, if you had just a theory of particles, if you put it on a circle and shrink it, the theory becomes better and better and you get dimensional reduction with no extra particles appearing. So existence of extended objects is a requirement if this distance conjecture is correct. Does that answer your question? I think the question by, was it Igor who asked? Or who asked the question about the, about the uh, extra dimension, uh, extended objects? So this is what I meant. Okay, the next criteria is that the gravity is always the weakest force. Now, um, so in string theory compactification, it has been observed that whenever we have charged particles, the electric force between the elementary charged states are always stronger than the gravitational force. For example, in four dimension, the, if you have particles of mass M and charge E, the gravitational attraction which goes like m squared of r squared is smaller than electric repulsion. In the context of our universe, this simply follows by mass of the electron being much, much less than the mass electric charge where you measure here in Planck units. The mass of the electron is 10 to minus 23 in Planck units and E is 10 to the minus one. So the electric repulsion between two electrons is much higher than the gravitational attraction they experience. So of course, in our universe, this is true. The claim is that this is true in any universe, that no solution of gravity could have had a situation where the mass of the would-be electrons are bigger than their charges, that the gravity is always weaker. So the, the effect is always self-repulsion. So black hole can explain the weak gravity conjecture at least heuristically, start with a, extreme of black hole q equals to m and suppose that this black hole can evaporate as we just said should be possible for all the non-supersymmetric one even the extreme ones well when this evaporates it will it will eva it will uh, it will emit charged particles with charge q and mass m let's say which is small q and small m so this decreases the total charge and mass of the black hole uh, so now you have Q minus Q, but now should satisfy the 
the condition that uh, black hole should be uh, should have no naked singularity. So the lack of naked singularity means m minus the capital M minus the small m, which is the mass of the remaining black hole, should still be bigger, bigger than the charge of the remaining black hole. But we started with capital Q equals to m. So this gives you an equality in the opposite direction that the mass of the emitted object should be less than or equal to the charge of the emitted object. The m equal to q can only occur for supersymmetric case, the BPS states. There is further evidence for the weak gravity conjecture. Pure Maxwell theory coupled to Einstein gravity leads to naked singularities. Let me explain why or how it was discovered. This was discovered in the following way in the context actually uh, was was actually in the ADS context this was discovered, but let me explain. So people, so Santos and uh, Horowitz studied and collaborators studied Einstein's theory coupled to electrical field in the ADS context, and they assumed that there's no charge state. And what they noticed was that if you increase the electrical field, you can start with, you can start with a situation which is not singular, no, no singularity in Einstein's in the metric or anything, and you gradually crank up the electrical field as a function of time, and you end up with a naked singularity. So this violated the cosmic censorship conjecture that you create out of no, um, no singularity, you evolved it, and you got a naked singularity. Now, this could have been saying, okay, maybe the, naked, the, the cosmic censorship is not valid, and that's what it is. However, it turns out there's a different resolution which rescues the cosmic censorship. So weak gravity conjecture leads to avoiding this. How does it work? First of all, you cannot have pure Maxwell theory. You must have charged state. That's the completeness of spectrum I was telling you about. There must be charged state. Secondly, the weak gravity conjecture tells you that among these states, there should be states whose mass is less than their charge. So there should be light enough states. So not only there are charged states, but the charges, their masses are not too big either. Their mass is lighter than their charge. It turns out that when you take those solutions that they, were, they had found, which led to naked singularities, when you included these charged particles, massless and charged, precisely when you made the electrical field strong, it created these mass charged particles in such a way that screened it electrical field and got rid of the naked singularity. So in other words, the weak gravity conjecture and the completeness of spectrum led to restoring cosmic censorship. So that's a, an amazing connection between completely unrelated sounding statement, the cosmic censorship with the criteria we, I was just telling you about. So this is what the kind of things that gives us more confidence that we are getting something that we can believe in because they are, they are fit with different aspects of Einstein theory and quantum gravity that we had kind of seen in different contexts. Another application of the weak gravity conjecture to our universe in, is that in our universe, which is something quasi the sitter at least, something almost like the sitter because we have positive lambda, which doesn't seem to change too much or maybe not at all. You, I was talking about the condition that you have evaporation of the black holes that give you the condition that the mass is less than charge. That was turns out to be for the small black holes. If you take the charged black holes, which are huge, almost the size of the whole universe, it gives you inequality in a different direction. It tells you that the mass should be not, not less than a Q, but bigger than a Q times lambda to one quarter, square root of Q times lambda to one quarter, where lambda is the cosmological constant. So in our universe, that means that mass of the electron should be bigger than 10 to the minus 31 and less than 10 to the minus one. And this is interesting because it, of course, works for electron, the, that's, which is the mass 10 to the minus 23. It is not a very strong prediction, but it's at least a quantitative prediction with the lower and upper bound, which gives you at least a range for the mass of the electron between 10 to the minus 1, 10 to the minus 31. Lambda to 1 quarter turns out to be the neutrino mass scale. So this basically is telling you that the electron is more massive than neutrino. Now, restrictions on critical points of V. So can you, can you get any, are there any restrictions when V is positive or on how flat it can be? 
And an important, this is an important question for early cosmology in the context of inflation and for late cosmology in the context of dark dimension, dark, dark energy, I mean. So, so usually in inflation, we have a situation where you have, you start with a relatively flat region with the high potential and you roll and you come down to some minimum uh, with some energy, which we say which should be the dark energy that we measure. Now, to, to, get, to get the restrictions on critical points is difficult because precisely when V is positive, unlike the V negative anti the sitter case, there cannot be any supersymmetry. Supersymmetry must be broken. So we have no really easy examples in string theory which uh, have supersymmetry, which we have a lot of control with. In fact, every example we can construct from string theory where V is positive ends up being unstable. So we don't have any exactly stable solution in string theory with V positive, unlike anti desitter which we have plenty of examples. In fact, this is related to the fact that the potentials that we get in string theory always exponentially goes down at infinite distance in field space when you have, when you have, a, uh, when you have a field that uh, can be there. And so this, this situation in particular uh, has been uh, obtained in string theory that not only V goes down to zero, but it goes exponentially fast to zero. And uh, the rate of exponential in Planck units is bigger than square root of two. This of course implies that even if you had something like a de Sitter, at best it's metastable. It cannot be totally stable. It will always decay because at far enough in the infinity, the potential should go to zero. So, no, so this is believed to be the case that there is no model of dark energy. We are not sure if the sitter exists. We have no construction, no reliable construction of a metastable the sitter, even though there are attempts like KKLT, but I would say we still do not have a reliable construction. But regardless of that, no matter what, it always is gonna decay at this metas in a metastable way. And we don't know what, what the rate would be from that perspective. A uh, decitter swampland constraint at large field values gives you the restriction that V prime is bigger than constant times V. And this leads to a explanation of why the potential always falls off exponentially. So that's an explanation of it. And this can be explained uh, in different ways, but uh, that there is a condition that there's a decidish swampland conjecture which tells you that the slope of the potential is always bigger than an order one constant in Planck units times of potential, uh, or if it is, or if it is uh, v prime is zero, it's unstable, sufficiently unstable. That is, the slope is much is less than order one minus one in Planck units. And there is another version of the same statement, which is what's called the trans Plankian censorship, which says that if you have an expanding universe. It cannot be that the sub Planckian region of that universe becomes bigger than the horizon at some point. Now, you cannot have a situation like some smaller region, some region smaller than the Planck unit becomes bigger than the whole horizon. This is this statement. This is called trans Planckian censorship conjecture. If you take this restriction, you actually end up deriving that V prime should be bigger than CV, and you actually get the correct ex exponent C. So you can explain this. Now, this restriction does allow the sitter, but it's, it tells you that the lifetime of the sitter cannot be too large. So swampland conjectures are, are in my tension with inflation. Inflation is, cannot be ruled out, but physical scenarios seem at least to be highly fine too with inflation because you need longer range for inflation and that's consist, inconsistent with both the distance conjecture where you get light state and the fact that the slope of V cannot be that flat. So you might ask, if, if the inflation has a problem, doesn't that say a problem for swampland conditions? Well, puzzles of early universe arise after one makes one major assumption. Uh, for example, this homogeneity and the horizon problem, which led to the motivation for inflation, arises when we make assumptions, which is that odds with duality. The main assumption is that if you take our universe and push it back in time, it's valid at all time to be described by a fundamental uh, effective theory that we have, maybe with a finite number of additional fields that become massive. 
that become relevant. However, that's unusual. And I was just saying that's inconsistent with the distance conjecture because if you go to an extreme limit in string theory, like the radius of the universe going to zero or temperature going to infinity, the description we get should break down. That's a distance conjecture. So from the viewpoint of dualities or distance conjecture, we should be getting a dual description. The description of our universe cannot be valid if you push it down infinitely far down in distance. So this suggests that our universe did arise from a dual picture from a dual region, not from a region where we understand with our effective field theory. Our effective field theory is going to have to break down at early times. So therefore the motivation for inflation would, be, would not be the correct motivation. And the dual description is non-local. Like the winding modes of the dual description, they give a dual description which are non-local relative to us. So the horizon problem that's, that's, that's being solved by inflation or homogeneity that's being solved by inflation will be solved by non-locality of the dual description, like winding modes relative to momentum modes. The fact that they are non-local non in our universe will give you correlation which, are, uh, which are, solves the horizon problem in the cosmology. And the homogeneity will be solved because these winding modes will be non-local relative to our degrees of freedom, and they can decay to our degrees of freedom. And therefore, uh, this would lead to a diff totally different picture for early universe than what we are familiar with. One can ask what kind of a picture are we getting for the present and the future of the universe? The, the Transplankian censorship conjecture, the conjecture that the subplankian regions cannot get bigger than the Planckian region, puts a bound on the lifetime of the universe that cannot be of order of, well, either if you take the sitter, it's like 30 times the Hubble, or if you take the TCC, which is Transplankian censorship conjecture, you get a log correction, which is up to two trillion years. So it gives you a bound, uh, which is up to order of 100 or 10 to 100 times age of our current universe as a potential lifetime that something should happen, that either decay or light states appearing in our universe then. The smallness of cosmological constant, as I have already mentioned, leads to a prediction of a light tower of KK modes in one extra dimension. That's the most exciting aspect of this uh, uh, Swampland program. And this actually is interesting because you could say, well, why didn't we discover these light modes? The claim is actually we have discovered these light modes. These light modes, the KK modes, are nothing but the dark matter. So in other words, the dark energy, which is lambda goes to zero, which gives you a tower of light state, gives you a unification of the dark energy and dark matter together, the dark matter being that tower I was talking about. So the duality tower is that dark tower or KK tower, which constitutes the dark matter. And you can actually check that this not only works, it actually works beautifully. Now, in fact, it can explain uh, the coincidence problem, why the temperature at which the radiation, and matter, radiation have equal density to matter is so close to the time that the dark energy starts dominating. The dark energy has dominated in the recent epoch and that's also consistent with the matter and radiation equality temperature. The reason for this turns out to be uh, related simply to the condition that the moduli fields in string theory should have decayed by the Hubble time because otherwise you will never get a de Sitter space. So to have a de Sitter space, if you precondition on having a de Sitter space, their mass should be sufficiently large for this to happen. And the mass that you get is of the order of one GeV. And so if you put that as an initial condition for our universe well, at temperature around one GeV, it will automatically create the KK gravitons with exactly the right abundance that we see in our universe and will give an equality, matter, radiation, and dark energy parametrically, no matter what your lambda is. You can choose any lambda. This phenomena will always happen, the coincidence. The matter, radiation, equality will happen at the same time as the dark energy. They are glued together. And previously, this was explained using anthropic argument by Weinberg. So Weinberg at that time used this to predict what lambda should be, the range of lambda. And the fact that the range of lambda is more or less the same range as the matter radiation equality is actually automatically follows without appealing to the anthropic principle. So let me conclude by saying that the swampland conditions can lead to potentially observable consequences for particle physics and cosmology. 
almost all quantum field theories are in the swampland. Therefore, fine tuning such as hierarchy problem may end up having a different solution. Severe restriction on consistent quantum gravity theories. These ideas suggest restrictions on light matter fields. And moreover, positive energy in the context of quantum gravity is a blessing because it's very, very highly restricted and lead to local and global instabilities. And this may explain coincidence problem via graviton excitations in a micron scale fifth dimension. And new ideas in particular dualities are expected to play a key role in early universe. Thank you. Uh, thank you a lot, Kurun. Uh, we had some questions uh, during the talk, but are there more questions for now? I don't see any reasons. Yeah, um, uh, may okay. I? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, hi, Kumrun. Hi, uh, Nice talk. Yeah, thanks. Uh, very good summary. I was uh, learned a lot of uh, things about the program that you have. Uh, how well do does the standard model satisfy? I mean, how is it doing in terms of the criteria that you have for consistency with quantum gravity? In what, what aspect of standard model do you mean? Uh, I mean, according to all the all the points that you had about consistent yes. theories that can be coming good good quantum field theories. Yes. So from that point of view, how well does the uh, standard model fare? Well, the standard model does not violate any of the conditions we have put for swampland. That's of course uh, better be. Otherwise, we have not done our homework properly. But examples I mentioned, like the electron mass, for example, in the standard model, those aspects. So, so those are some aspects of, of things we have checked, but the swampland condition is not in such a way to say, so we, the, the, the basic thing is that you have a big space and swampland condition puts conditions like you cannot be on the left of this line, you cannot be on the right of this curve or whatever. It is not at the level of saying, oh, this point, is it good or bad? You can, in other words, you can say, oh, can, it's easy to say it's bad, but to say it's good, we cannot do that. We cannot say our standard model is good. Because we, to find good ones, you have to have infinitely many criteria because by definition, the set of allowed ones are measure zero. They're just like points. Yeah, cannot, but it, it, it could be close to a boundary, for example. Yeah, it could have been. Yeah. It could have been close to the boundary. Now, so that there's no so measure. For example, for the, the, the weak gravity conjecture, we're far from the boundary. The mass of the electron is much less than. Now, you can ask, how about the monopole? So the weak gravity conjecture also makes a prediction for the monopole mass. It says that the mass of monopole mass is less than 10 times the Planck mass. This is not assuming anything like grand unification or whatever. The completeness of spectrum means that there is a monopole and that the weak gravity tells you that the monopole mass cannot be more than 10 times the Planck mass. Now, that's interesting because you know, it opens up a possibility of, of, of such objects being more massive than typically in gut theories, for instance, but it cannot be too, too infinite, too, too big, but still of the order of M Planck. So there are these aspects of it. So 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 the theory fares well. Standard model. Is there any bound on the mass of the neutrino from this? So I did not mention, but actually there is there's a unification with the dark dimension that I told you about. So the dark dimension, which is the extra dimension that's forced on you by the distance conjecture applied to the sitter, would actually also be a natural explanation of the neutrino mass. Namely, the the you have one extra dimension. Then, and our universe, the standard model, cannot be lying in the five dimensional bulk. And the reason is that if it did, you get a tower of every particle we know of. Like electron would have a tower of electron volt separated object, which we don't have. So we better be localized in the fifth dimension, like on a brain. So if you are on a brain, that's already a strong restriction. But then you can ask, OK, what about the neutrinos in this context? Well, we have left handed neutrinos, which are, of course, living with this on the, on the brain, but what about the right-handed neutrino? It turns out that the right-handed neutrino can naturally be a bulk mode. Namely, take a fermion in fifth dimension, and this will couple to the brain modes by gravitational forces, by, well, naturally by, by overlap, I meant. So you have a wave function. There'll be fermions which overlap with others, and they can play the role of right-handed neutrino, which are neutral with respect to our gauge group sector. If you just assume that, it predicts the mass of the neutrino also in the milli-electron volt region. 
So without doing anything, we are relating the dark energy with neutrino physics. So, and then you can ask, how about the Higgs sector? Well, this will also predict a mass of sterile neutrino because these fermions, if it's in the box, it's the tower of them. If you assume that the mass of the tower of the neutrinos and the mass of the actual neutrinos, there's no hierarchy, they're of the same order. It predicts that the Higgs mass is of the order of GeV. It predicts that it, it predicts also the hierarchy. So there are all of these things which fall into place in terms of lambda. So knowing lambda gives you lambda to the one quarter is the neutrino scale, lambda to the one six is the Higgs scale, and lambda to the one twelfth is the higher dimensional Planck scale, which is ten to the ten GeV. So there are all of these aspects, which is so there's one fine-tuned parameter, lambda. Why lambda is small is not explained. But if you take lambda to be small, then you get all these relations. So the relations between them falls into place. Thank you. You're welcome. I have a question about this distinct landscape, but it might be very naive. Yes. Is there a way to, to somehow reduce the string landscape? Is this somehow to what? Is there a way to somehow reduce the string landscape? The Read number? this, yes. Yeah. Yeah, so what we so the evidence for this came precisely from studying the string landscape, more specifically in the context of supersymmetric theories for which there is no potential. Otherwise, in the non-supersymmetric ones, you typically end up getting a potential. So in the cases where there are no potentials, we did study the distance conjecture and we got the exponents. And we, in fact, we know the exponent can always is always bigger than one over root d minus two. So we have much more specific values. I think Martin has a question. Yes, uh, I have actually two unrelated questions. Uh, well, thanks for a very nice talk, very nice Thank overview. Uh, so, um, well, one one question is uh, about the Higgs mass. So is there any reason why the experimentally observed Higgs mass from your perspective is close to the stability bound? To the, to the what to the watch which the stability, stability bound that if you uh, run the mass to higher energies uh what, what you you find oh yeah, that... yeah stability of the higgs potential you mean yes yeah actually one aspect of it i did not mention is that the higgs stability bound gives you the fact that this instability at 10 to the 10 gv uh -huh. 10 or 11 gv yes and that's related to the higher dimensional Planck mass in the scenario i was just telling you about so the fifth dimension Planck becomes 10 to the 10, 11 GV was forced on us. So that could be related to the fact that something should happen at 10 to 10 or 11 GV before, before getting to Planck, the naive Planck scale. So the effective Planck scale will be lowered down. So that, that could potentially explain that. But, but uh, coming back to another aspect of your question is, is there any reason that the Higgs is such a small mass compared mm -hmm. to the 10 to the 10 GV, let's say, if you view the, or the effective Planck scale to be this big? So, I gave you I gave one one potential explanation, which is not explanation in some sense observation that if you assume that the sterile neutrinos, the neutrinos in the bulk, and the neutrinos that you live on standard model have roughly the same mass scale, it gives you the mass scale of the Higgs to be the cosmological constant to the one sixth, which roughly gives you GeV scale. It doesn't give you 100 GeV, but gives you GeV scale. So up to order one, it's roughly on the right ballpark. However, there's yet another argument which suggests that. Uh, GV scale is automatically natural in this setup, and let me try to explain. So, this is this is a very simple explanation, but it has to do with the the, the fact that any uh, universe which has positive cosmological constant, in the context of the Deseter, in the concept of swampland conjectures, cannot be stable. But more than that, it cannot have a lifetime bigger than the natural scale in Deseter, namely the lifetime of the our universe of the scale of Hubble, which is one over square root of lambda. So if lambda is a cosmological constant, its lifetime is roughly of the order of one over root lambda. We are not gonna last forever. We, are, we have a finite basis of, of lifetime, which is one over root lambda. Let me assume that, let me assume that's correct. The assumption that the, the, this is basically, this is the Desitter conjecture or Transplanckian censorship conjecture tells you in such a universe, you could not have lasted more than one over root lambda. Now, suppose you have a string compactification, whatever form they have, they, they stabilize the modes and this and that. If your modes, if you have very light modes, however you ended up with them, if their masses is sufficiently low, 
they, to settle down, it takes a while for the mass to decay away. And the decay rate of these states to, to, to decay down to their ground state is of the order of, is suppressed by one over order M Planck. That's because of the gravitational effect. So, so therefore, the rate of decay of any mass moduli fields should be of the order of one over M Planck squared. And so to get the rate is M cubed over M Planck squared. So you get M cubed over M Planck squared, where M is the mass of the moduli field, is that roughly the rate of decay. And this rate better be bigger than the Hubble rate, the, uh, the, the Hubble scale. Otherwise, it would not have decayed by our universe scaling. In other words, M cubed over M Planck squared should be bigger than square root of lambda, which is the Hubble scale. This gives you that the mass should be bigger than lambda to the one sixth. And that's a GV scale. So GV scale is a natural scale, which is pegged to lambda. Now, this doesn't tell you exactly why to just exactly at that scale start the hit, but it tells you GV is an interesting scale connected to the, to the dark energy. So everything is some sense connected to the dark energy in this kind of thinking. Interesting. Well, my, uh, my, my second question was like all string theories kind of have a dilaton and whether this is like some special field that plays a role in your analysis. The, 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 the analysis, the role of the field that's special here in the case of the fifth dimension is the dark, is the radius of the extra dimension, mm -hmm. for example. That's one, one moduli which plays a role. And the other one is the moduli which controls the size of the, of our brain inside the five dimension, which we do not know, but I'm saying that their mass should be bigger than the GV scale. And what about the string theory deleton? The string theory deleton has to have stabilized somewhere. We don't know the value. Mm -hmm. We do not know what that value is in our universe. We do not know whether we are close to a perturbative corner of string theory or not, but we do know. So, so I, let me explain better. <clears throat> I told you Lambda is very small. And based on that, I said we are at the large distance limit in something. It could have been dilaton. It could have been weak coupling string. Could it have been weak coupling string? It turns out it cannot be weak coupling string because it if it were, it would have predicted a string uh, mass of the string of the order of electron volt. Mm -hmm. And the mass of the string electron volt is ruled out easily by experiments. So therefore, that cannot be. So that's why we the only option was large, this large uh, extra dimension. The dilaton is not what is weak in our universe. We do not have a weak coupling string in our universe. Oh, I see. So it must be very massive, the dilaton. Yes, yes. It, it's, not, it's not the weak coupling. It's not very large. The coupling is not large. For the, if, it, if there is a string, which we think there is, the coupling is not small. OK, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I have a question. Uh, uh, so if we consider uh, some, uh, say, generic effective field theory, so there are various these positivity constraints uh, on the coefficients which appear in the theory. So uh, so how do we, I mean, how do uh, these constraints fit into all these uh, things? Good question. Good uh, question. So there are positivity constraints for just field theory by itself, like coefficients of f to the fourth term and things like that. These conditions get modified when you have gravity. So it's not the same conditions you are familiar with. And in fact, people have a harder time establishing it. These uh, conditions come from unitarity and symmetries like crossing and all that. When it comes to gravity, it's much more difficult because of the structure of the graviton pole. Now, uh, nevertheless, people have studied aspects of positivity in that context. For example, the weak gravity conjecture turns out to be related to a com combination of the coefficients of f to the fourth term and RF squared term. Some combination of these coefficients should be positive. So you can translate in that language and people have tried to give argument why that combination is positive, but people have not been able to really give a convincing full argument for it. Thank you. You're welcome. So are there more questions? Oh, if not, I would like to, to thank Kunwaba for this very nice review thanks. talk. Thanks for every thanks for listening and hope to see you guys later. Have a good yeah. Time. Uh, the video will be available online. So if you want to go back to it, just do it. Thanks. Okay. Thank bye you. Bye-bye. <laughs>